Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Welcome back. The, uh, for people who may not be entirely familiar with the Spring Conference, one of our longest running events uh, is the Passing Show. So thank you for being here for it. I'm Ashley Olson, Executive Director here at the National Willa Cather Center. And today's panel discussion, titled Literary Prizes, Acclaim and Controversy, is made freely available through the support of Humanities Nebraska. So we thank them very much. Uh, Humanities Nebraska is a statewide nonprofit organization inspiring and enriching personal and public life by offering opportunities to thoughtfully engage with history and culture, and they receive additional funding from the Nebraska Cultural Endowment. So if you enjoy this type of programming, please do consider supporting Humanities Nebraska and the Willa Cather Foundation with a contribution. Uh, again, I know some of you weren't with us when we kicked off the conference on Thursday afternoon, so I also want to offer thanks to uh, Dr. Melissa Holmstead, this year's Spring Conference Academic Director, who will be moderating our panel. Dr. Holmstead is a graduate of Smith College in the University of Pennsylvania and is currently Professor of English and Program Faculty in Women's and Gender Studies at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. She also directs the Cather Project in the Department of English and serves as associate editor of the Complete Letters of Willa Cather, a digital edition. Among other, er, among other books and numerous articles, Dr. Homestead is the author of The Only Wonderful Things, The Creative Partnership of Willa Cather and Edith Lewis, published last year by Oxford University Press. So with that, we welcome Dr. Homestead to introduce our panelists. I almost feel like I should get out my ball cap because this light, oh, actually, maybe I should. Anyway, uh, the light is kind of blinding. Um, so I'm going to briefly introduce people, say who they are. There's more, there's more information in the program at the back. But to explain why I thought about them for the panel. So uh, Pat Leach here is the director of Lincoln City Libraries, soon to retire, um, and she also as which, and that uh, the libraries runs a One Book, One Lincoln community reading program, which I think is adjacent to the whole world of prizes and awards. And she, of course, also is the voice of All About Books on Nebraska Public Media. Uh, and Mike Shuith is a professor at Collin College in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And I invited him because of his excellent dissertation at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln on Cather and celebrity culture. And if there is something that um, makes you a celebrity, it could be winning a prize. And then we have Jim English, who gave one of the keynotes the other night, who is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, and a book on the economy of prestige about prizes and prize culture. So that's an obvious reason he's here, although I think he's been thinking there's so much gather here, it's been a little overwhelming, because that's not his field. Uh, and then we have, yeah, then we have James, James Jap, and uh, JJ is a teaching professor at Penn State Allegheny. And I know that he was reading and teaching Pulitzer Prize winning novels as a kind of practice. So I thought it'd be interesting to have him for this panel. Um, you've been getting a lot of questions. You've been seeing through WOVA and you get emails prompting you. And um, some of the questions, you, although you can't tell from the questions of the live polls, which are one at a time, are keyed to this panel because I wanted people to participate as we're talking and then also maybe jump off for more conversation later. So you will see those questions above, and if you have not answered them yet, and you've got your phone and you want to be rude and fiddle while we're talking, you can go to, which, come on, we know we all do it, but uh, you go, to the, you go to your messages and you will see the questions under those titles. So now we've heard the first question I want to ask is pretty broad, and it's kind of the question of the conference, but also to make it about Cather and to make it about broader questions even than that. So how did the Pulitzer Prize awarded for one of ours matter when it was awarded and during Cather's lifetime? And how does it matter today? This is really gonna be a conversation. We don't have extensive prepared remarks. So we will just go ahead and start with, what we start with, Pat. Whoop, working on the mic. There we go. There we go. Um, I feel the least qualified to answer the question. Uh, what I would note, though, is thinking of the impact of the Pulitzer on, this, on the work of this particular book, 
my sense as the person who thinks more of the general reading public in terms of who is reading Cather, who is paying attention to the various aspects of her career, it seems to me at this point, a hundred years later, I think that the general reader is more aware of Cather as a classic American author and that the Pulitzer probably doesn't matter that much anymore. Although I have been hyper aware in the last four weeks and especially the last two days uh, now of how often we use the phrase Pulitzer Prize winning, Pulitzer Prize winning. And so uh, I'm intrigued by the fact that publishers still consider that an effective marketing phrase. And since they're continuing to be the ones who have a financial stake in the continuing interest in her work, it makes me want to have a little bit more information about how they see it and how they see that as an effective phrase. My observation, though, as a person who talks with a lot of general readers, is that if you ask a reader who is fairly familiar with Cather but not a Cather scholar, I don't think that they could say which of her books is the Pulitzer Prize winner. Go ahead. Um, this is a complicated question. <laughs> I think, uh, would you pull up the PDF file? It's in a web browser. Uh, wait, oh, there we go. So um, Maureen Corrigan talked last night about how kind of things change over time in terms of prizes and how we understand them. And so this was published about a month after, um, this is in late June, um, a full page article in the New York Times uh, by the critic Herbert Gorman, Herbert Gorman, um, sort of justifying Cather's Pulitzer win. He sort of, he kind of justifies her winning by pushing all of the emphasis on the Nebraska part of the novel and sort of louding her off the hook for the, the Claude in France. I kind of wonder too if maybe Claude would have been a better title because everyone refers to it as the novel when they're reviewing it as Claude in Nebraska versus Claude in France. But um, so it seemed to, that name seems to catch. But uh, uh, so there's a justification, but there's also like a really interesting argument brewing here about what is American literature that open, that the, the award cracks open and, and Cather's at the center of a conversation about what does that mean to be an American writer. And that has a lot of power to it culturally, even if people are disagreeing about the value of the award, her name is still in the middle of the conversation, which is really, really important. Um, I also think in terms of looking at letters and um, seeing what was happening before this, um, the, the switch to Knopf um, and the, her desire for Maya Antonia to be like, um, nominated and, it, and nothing happened, she got what she wanted with one of ours. Like her first big you know, risky move with changing her career, um, she got what she wanted. Um, but the other part of that, too, when you look at letters like to Dorothy Canfield Fisher, is uh, I think the conversation could have been totally different had Cather had publicly said this was based on a connection to my family. Like, I have a, a connection to this. She never made that public. She asked Dorothy Canfield Fisher in reviewing the book not to, not to let any of that out of the bag. So she, there was like this kind of torment between her public and her private life with this novel. And so the Pulitzer win, like, just sort of pushed the boundaries of that pressure in all of the directions. Well, you know, it's interesting because when she's interviewed about some of her other Nebraska-based fiction, she does say it was based oh, yeah. on a woman that I knew when I was, yeah. but she doesn't ever want people to know that it's based on someone in her family. Well, and there's that really, like, it gave me goosebumps when I read it, the line where she says that um, in a letter that, you know, part of me is buried in France with Claude and part of... Claude is living with me here. And so there's this just tremendous emotional pull in this, in this whole thing. And like, I think it would have been extremely difficult to, um, to manage that. But then um, when we look at um, the New York Times, it's another, it's at the bottom. Okay, which one? There's the New York Times obituary. No, wait, this one? Nope. Um, just in terms of Maureen Corrigan's point again about like the context changing over time, there's sort of this interesting 
uh, comment about um, justifying, like again, it kind of justifies, her obituary justifies um, the win by, by instead saying that it, it pulled her apart from Edith Wharton in like 1947. That's like the context is that this award is important. Like it might, one of ours might have not have been her best book, but it was the thing that pulled her out underneath Edith Wharton, that was never the conversation in 1923, right? Yeah. No one was talking about Edith Wharton and Cather at that moment. So like, you can sort of see how the award, you know, like there's always this shifting going on in terms of the conversation and how it's understood, so. Yeah, I think that, is this coming through the mic okay? Yeah, okay. Um, you might yeah. wanna hold it a little closer. The, Pul the Pulitzer um, had a lot of impact, considering that it's only just started in 1918, right? So this is a very early prize. And prizes typically take a while to gain traction. But the Pulitzer had a couple of things going for it. Um, one, uh, we've been hearing a lot about, which is you know a few scandals and contretemps, um, in uh, especially around Sinclair Lewis, right? 1921, 1923. Um, 1926, when he turns down his Pulitzer and, um, and makes um, pissy remarks about the prize. All of that helps the prize and, and, um, and gives it, you know, I mean, scandals are the fuel for prizes, the lifeblood for prizes, because they, they, they put into play all of, the, um, all of the kind of vexed feelings that the public has around cultural taste and cultural expertise and and so on. So um, prizes profit greatly from scandal, and the Pulitzer had these nice scandals um, in its early years, as the Booker Prize did as well um, after its founding in 69. Um, but the other thing that the Pulitzer, I think, had going for it is that, you know, Joseph Pulitzer was a, was a journalist, and the Pulitzers were kind of first off, in his mind, journalism prizes. And because they're journalism prizes, every time a novelist is announced as a, as a Pulitzer winner, that's happening when also a bunch of journalists are being given prizes. And when journalists are given prizes, um, every major newspaper in the country puts that on the front page. So um, the, Pulitzer's had, the Pulitzer Prize for the Best Novel has built into it um, this publicity factor that other prizes don't have. And a, a strong contrast here can be made with the first two annual Book of the Year, Novel of the Year prizes in the UK and Britain, which are the um, James Tate Black Memorial Prize and the Hawthorne Prize, both founded in 1919, or both first um, presented in 1919. Um, and I don't know whether anybody's heard of either one of them, um, but uh, they were both pretty quiet affairs um, the, the, the James Tate Black in particular was um, uh, done out of Edinburgh, far from the center of action. They were not widely reported in the papers and they didn't want to be. They, they, they both were publicity shy. They wanted to be kind of dignified and liter like strictly literary affairs. Um, and that's fine, <laughs> but it means that they never had much impact. Um, whereas the Pulitzer, I think, did sell more books. It, it raised the reputation, or at least spread the reputation of writers. Prizes can bring a kind of stigma with them as well. But, um, but the Hawthorne didn't, and the James Tate Black didn't really have any, any effect. And even after 50 years, they were still pretty much unknown in Britain, um, except among a few literary people. And that's why um, the... Uh, the guy at, at Jonathan Cape, young editor, um, said in 1968, we need to have a real novel of the year prize that really generates some attention, um, like the Prix Goncourt in France and like the Pulitzers in America. And so he went to the chairman of Booker uh, PLC and said, how about you guys sponsoring a big prize here in the UK to get the Booker running? Um, normally, the first prize has a big first mover advantage if you get in there early and you do it right, you know it's gonna be really hard for any subsequent prize to displace you as the sort of prize of prizes in the field. But, um, but, but you, can, you can miss that opportunity as the Hawthorne and the James Tate Black did if you don't gain some traction 
early. So, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, well, I think it certainly mattered when the book was published because it created that controversy and stirred some controversy. I'm not sure, back to the question, that it necessarily matters now for uh, one of ours. It certainly matters for recent winners of the Pulitzer. Uh, the most recent Pulitzer winner, the Netanyahu's by Joshua Cohen, hasn't, didn't, hasn't sold very well, uh, kind of unknown, but now, since it won, it is moving up the, the publication charts. I think Cather in 19, or when the, when we look at the winners in these early years, they're all, with the exception of one of ours, very nostalgic. There, it's, it's back to that idea of the wholesome, not the whole of American culture, but the wholesome aspect of American culture. And when we look at some of them, such as Booth Tarkington's two, two novels, Magnificent Ambersons and Alice Adams, were kind of going back to a bit of nostalgia. Cather's, the, the novel that followed Cather, Margaret Wilson's The Abel McLaughlin's, also has that kind of feel. I wouldn't recommend that one. Um, <laughs> I really want to read that one just because nobody reads it. I mean, that is appealing to me. I mean, who doesn't want to? It's like a long historical novel about Midwestern Presbyterians or something, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's long. <laughs> um, it was a first novel. But to, you know, back to the idea of the controversy, uh, when The Age of Innocence won in, what, 1921, it was against Sinclair Lewis. Uh, Main Street, I'm, I'm correct, right? And 1920 for 1920. Yeah, 1920, and both of them are satirical. Both of them are critical of American culture. But Edith Wharton's Main Street takes place in 1920, 1910s. Edith Wharton takes place back in the 1870s. It, it, it gives it, these early ones are centered around nostalgia and looking back and kind of grabbing onto something. And that's why I think Will is one of ours is not. And that's a change, I think, in well, the Well, that'd prize. be interesting. If she had gotten the Pulitzer for My Antonia, it would have been for a book that is 150% nostalgia, right? But that's not the one that got the award, even though it was probably submitted. Right, right. And it, it might have gotten it, but they hadn't. Was it out yet? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was the first year. There, there is, you know, sometimes... If uh, yeah, sometimes it's a, sometimes a suspicion that uh, a writer is winning a novel of the year award for a novel that they wrote previously that wasn't awarded. You know, that it's sort of there's a bit of a lifetime achievement element. So it's possible that the Prairie trilogy, you know, was in the minds of the judges when they uh, when they, when they chose one of ours. Well, I was going to say uh, more about Scandal, but we've heard these stories so many times already about Sinclair Lewis being passed over and. Um, the, you know, unenthusiastic response of the jurors who recommended one of ours without enthusiasm and also the hella sexist reviews uh, by some of the critics of one of ours. But the question for me, though, and this is also going to, we're going to have one of our poll, our first poll question. Let's see here. Oops. Okay. One person was brave enough to say they don't think that one of ours is a good novel. I am up there for contrarians. I, but I wanted to just sort of ask, all, say, well, is it prize worthy? Is one of ours a Pulitzer Prize worthy novel? What's your take? And not everybody has to answer. If Jim doesn't want to play American literary historian, he doesn't have to. So um, you want to, you're going to go for it, JJ? Maybe we should just leave him on. It's getting complicated. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. You think it is a good novel? <laughs> yes. I, without question. And I think it's one of the best from my own personal experience, I think I've read about 60, 65 of the, of the winners. And uh, I, I refuse to read um, Gone with the Wind. But, um, <laughs> but I think it's one of the best. And I will, uh, I will argue with our Maureen Corgan last night. I think the hinge between the first part and the second part is perfect. So. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I haven't read all the Pulitzer Prize novels uh, either, but... Um, and I'm no Cather expert. I, don't, I wouldn't say that it's the best of Cather's novels, 
Um, but uh, it's an awfully it's an awfully good novel. I mean, to me, co coming to Ed Cather as a as a non-specialist, you know, I'm I'm struck by the strangeness of some of the language that's used to describe her, either critically or uncritically. You know, it's the sentimental, nostalgic, these sorts of things. I mean, I find Cather a very dark, very difficult kind of edgy and ironic author. And I think one of ours is a hard, it's a hard book. You know, it's, she writes about, about damage and disappointment and, uh, and, and shame um, and kind of self-loathing. And uh, I mean, I, 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 and, but these are, these are qualities of literature, of American fiction that I think are worthy of uh, prizes when they're, when they're done well. I said, maybe just leave the mics on. It's getting too complicated. Once you get that one back on, that one is particularly difficult. So anyway. Um, I guess I, I just sort of think it's partly timing, too, that, that culture, like in the, the moment, you know, that she was on, she was digging into something that made people uncomfortable in both good and bad ways, you know, in terms of talking about the war. And people were, it seemed like at the time, were kind of getting tired of the war and wanted to get past it. But she was digging into something that was uncomfortable, just like you know you were saying. And um, for that reason, I think maybe the prize kind of hit on that cultural moment to a different way of thinking about it. I'm intrigued by the the prize depends on who what else is published that year. So you know, looking back on it now, is it prize worthy? We're comparing it to 100 years of books and winners, which is different from who's your group at that time. So. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of thinking through what, is, what does that mean, but I was also intrigued by what Professor, Professor English said about it being somewhat edgy and not always happy. And even though sometimes I think Cather is portrayed as being sentimental in a certain way, I don't think that's what we see in this book. And I'm wondering if, I'm wondering to what degree that played into um, how the judges saw the book at the time. And I, and I don't know that we'll know that. I mean, I think for a lot of reviewers at the time, sentimental just meant woman author, whether or not it actually applied. It was is it just... possible to get out from under that? To, to, well, to I have mean, some the thing sense? Is How do we do that? I work on 19th century American women's fiction as my primary field, even more so than Willa Cather. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, as a term of a program in literary history, it's been hard to get out from under. I mean, I think it's, it's a thing. It can be a thing, but this is not the thing, <laughs> right? Sentimentality isn't bad. But this book isn't sentimental. Right. Um, but we had another question here related. If you were going to choose another Cather novel instead of one of ours, I think, JJ, you're going to maybe stick with one of ours. Which? And we will see our audience. Whoops, sorry, audience response, wrong thing. Well, now crap, you, now I can't get this one to. A few people have won more than once, Melissa, so I could pick two. No, I keep hitting the wrong key, sorry. Uh, oh, view, view results. Here we go. All right. So, and these were only the Cather novels that were published um, during the pendency of the Pulitzer. So you couldn't get Song of the Lark, for example. My Antonia, coming on strong. And I think actually Cather probably would have most appreciated that because she had, she was attached in a very personal way to Claude, as it were. But I think the book that she most valued herself was My Antonia. You see that in so much correspondence. A Lost Lady and the Professor's House. Death Comes to the Archbishop, also ranking high. Um, not much love for Sephira, Lucy, or Shadows. So what do you think? Anybody want to make a proposition? I, I could be brief because I've only read about half of Cather's novels. Um, uh, and so I, I, I'm going to choose through a proxy, my dissertation advisor, the uh, the, the novelist, Arturo Islas, um, forced me to read Cather when I was in graduate school. I had never read Cather. And he, and he said, start with My Antonia and then reread My Antonia. <laughs> 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 and so I did. So I'm going to say My Antonia. I, 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 as I've said more than once at this conference, I've read it over 100 times. So I have my own issues with My Antonia. Anybody else you want to you propose one that you would give it to other than one of ours? No? I would. Personally, I'd probably say my Antonia as well, but I think in terms of her chances, maybe 
Shadows was really popular and that could have been, you know, a contender for her. Uh, yeah, so. Okay then, so our next question. So Cather won several other prizes later in her career. The William Dean Howells Medal for Fiction from the American Academy of Arts and Letters for Death Comes to the Archbishop. Uh, the Prix Femina Americaine for Shadows on the Rock. The National Institute for Arts and Letters Gold Medal for Fiction, which was a career award. And yet it seems that the Pulitzer is the prize that adhered to her name and reputation. So why does the Pulitzer have this role? What happens when we pay attention to those other awards and prizes? I don't think any of those um, has the same cachet the same historical importance. I mean, I think it's as simple as that. The Pulitzer is a bigger deal. The Prix Femina is a very important prize in, in France. It was like the antidote to the all-male juried Prix Goncourt, which is the first of all the National Novel of the Year awards. Um, but the Prix Femina Americaine was just a short-lived kind of thing that they did a couple of times. Um, and, uh, and so it doesn't have that, it doesn't have the longevity you know, that would make it really very, very important. I think it probably meant a lot to, to Cather to have because it meant a translation into French and, um, you know, and, and sort of guaranteed sales in Paris. So that was great. But, um, but and I she don't was think quite the Francophile, so. She was uh, quite, quite a Francophile, Francophile yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Even if sort of articulated through Quebec, I think. But yeah. I have a couple of um, images. Oh, let's see if we can get the right ones here. Um, the one with the picture. Let's point for, out that we the, can't see the images, oh, so we great. don't really know what he's talking about. So Cather got really good press when she won these other awards later in her career. I mean, this one has a, features a picture, the Pre Femina. It was a really nice article that also listed all of the people that attended. I have a, a short little clip of that, too. Um, I'm not being able to yeah. find the... Oh, anyway. No, that's not but it. The... Free, the, um, the the pre uh, femina um, Cather, it's this sort of interesting details about she was very appreciative of the award. Um, she was sitting in a chair when they awarded it to her, and there's kind of an interesting note that she didn't stand up when they gave it to her, and that she just was, you know, talked about French culture and her connection to it. Um, and so I think for her, it just seemed like this was so different, and it was maybe more meaningful to her. But for these other awards, she almost, she got better press because the Pulitzer um, for one of ours was like buried in the New York Times. I mean, it was like an, an article that just said, well, a Cather won for one of ours. You know, like that, it was just that, you know, and then listed the other winners. Um, but by, as the, you know, 20s turned into the 30s, the prize culture became much more of a newsworthy, you know, outlet. And so she got her picture in the paper which is never a bad thing, but, you know, like the, the publicity, even though it might not in the long run, you know, be what we think of her at the time, she was getting a lot of really good press for these awards. So. I mean, I wonder too, um, in terms of the language, um, even the amended language, whether it's the whole atmosphere of American life or the wholesome atmosphere of American life and American manners and manhood, you know, that changes by the early 1930s. But I wonder if the Pulitzer, and I was interested when Maureen Corrigan said that when she judged it, they still preferred a book about American life, right? And I wonder if the Pulitzer still hangs on to us, because I know when we talk about Cather here at the National Willa Cather Center, even though she wrote novels that were not set, like she wrote Shadows on the Rock, right, not set in the United States, there still is this way to think about her as peculiarly American, and the subject matter of her books as American, and maybe the Pulitzer kind of adheres to that whole question of Americanness in a way that the other prizes didn't necessarily. Um, I, I think that's I think that's correct. And it was in 1930 when the Pulitzer changed their language because uh, Thornton Wilder's *The Bridge Over San Luis Rey* won the Pulitzer. So they shifted their language because that was a bit of a controversy because it was supposed to, it, didn't, it had nothing to do with American culture. It was set in Peru, right? Yes. Yes, yes. So, but it won still under the old language. They gave it anyway. Right, right. And then the next year, and that, that seems what, to what happens every time a controversy occurs within the Pulitzer. The next year they change the committee, they change the rules, they change the board. Um, or, 
1930, 32. When was what? Sorry. Uh, Thirty-two. Pearl Buck, they they had already changed it, um, so it was just the best novel by an American by the time Pearl Buck won. And yes. Thornton Wilder won in 1928. I'm sorry. I'm yeah, and it was on. still the atmosphere. It was supposed to be about American manners and mat, you know, manhood and the whole atmosphere, and it wasn't. But they still gave it the prize, right? So, um, but, but what's your understanding of the difference between the judgment of a prize committee at a particular moment versus the judgment of literary history? Right, so put another way, do prizes determine which books continue to be read after an initial moment of publication and reception or not? Now, I think Maureen Corrigan said something yesterday that I think I, I would disagree with her on this, actually. She was, you know, we've got to decide which books will last, right? Did the Pulitzer decide which books from the early era of the prize lasted? Okay, I'll just give you a little piece of information here, though. If you search the MLA International Bibliography, which is a primary tool for doing research in languages and liter modern languages and literature, you get 2,700 hits for Cather and only 700 for Sinclair Lewis, who won one, and there was the controversy about it. Um, I didn't even try Booth Tarkington because I don't think there's hardly anything on Booth Tarkington. Nobody writes about Booth Tarkington, and he got two in the early years of the prize. I, I would say that um, prizes clearly don't um, decide what, uh, what, what artists are going to be um, at the top of the hierarchy, you know, 50 years on Oops. or 100 years on. Um, but they contribute. They're part of that process. And they're not fundamentally different from the other things that also contribute to that process. In other words, prizes, there, there's, there could be a tendency to say prizes always get it wrong or prizes are, um, you know, they're incapable of judging correctly or something like that. That's clearly not true. Um, academics, the syllabus, the MLA, you know, doesn't always get it right either. You can look at the numbers of um, articles um, published about an author in MLA and they'll, they'll go way up and stay up for a while and then there's just like this precipitous collapse of interest in a particular writer. Other writers emerge um, other than Shakespeare and Austin, I don't know who has like really, you know, the kind of uh, forever um, lasting power. So, so I think that, that there's a whole set of complex mechanisms that, that contribute to these determinations, but they're all kind of messy, they're all social, they're all wrong a lot of the time, um, and you can't point to prizes as especially better or worse than others. I mean, once I was looking for some information about John Greenleaf Whittier, who was a very popular poet in his day and continued to be taught in the early 20th century and had a lot of scholarship. There was even a journal dedicated to John Greenleaf, Greenleaf Whittier. And he's come back a little because of his abolitionism, but he just went whoosh, yeah. off a cliff, off a cliff. Anybody else want to take that question? Well, I, I mean, I think it, it has something to do with it. It, has, it does contribute to the lasting power, but when we look at the list of winners over the years, there's, there's dozens that are, have been forgotten or well, we've got our, reading. we've got our winner. We've got our list here of how many people have read out of. We've got 61 responses to this poll. The first 10 ish years of the Pulitzer, the first Pulitzer awarded for the novel Ernest Poole, his family. One person out of 61 had read it. Um, Booth Tarkington, uh, the Magnificent Ambersons, 15. That's actually pretty high, much higher than literary history would say. The Age of Innocence, 50 out of 61. Alice Adams, three out of 61. That's another Tarkington. Three people have read Margaret Wilson. You must have been one, JJ. Did you answer the question? I did not answer the question. Oh, there are three people other than JJ who read Margaret Wilson. Edna Ferber, So Big, which Maureen Corgan said was an interesting and good book. I agree. Um, and let's see, Sinclair Lewis, Aerosmith, surprisingly high for his lesser known work about a research scientist, 18. Louis Bromfeld, there's a recent biography that's come out, and I thought something would flare up, but we've got one for his book, Early Autumn. Thornton Wilder, 26 for The Bridge of San Luis Rey, which I don't think anybody teaches, or is it in print even. And Julia Peterkin's Scarlet Sister Mary, thankfully only one. Because it's a really weird racist novel by a white woman imagining the life of this Scarlet Sister Mary in the cabins on a southern plantation, but anyway. And, and many of those 
many of those are out of print. Yes. And they're really hard to find. And, and, and like, except in old library copies, if your library hasn't deaccessioned them. Right, that break open when you open them. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think one of the other aspects of those that you mentioned is movies. So that I think many of us, when we see the Magnificent Ambersons, the movie, then think maybe we should go back and read the book. So I'm also thinking that many of the titles that you mentioned are ones that people would have seen movies of. So a whole other angle for why do people read books? It's because they've seen a movie. I think I would just add, you know, we could ask, compared to what? Like, who, who or what in 1922 or 1925 was accurately dis determining, you know, the, the, the novels that were going to be widely read 100 years later? You know, the prizes get it wrong, but they don't get it wrong more than, uh, than other things. I, as far I as, say, when, like book reviews, who liked which books and book reviews at the time doesn't tell us who would read them now. Book reviews are very imperfect. College uh, teaching and syllabi and, you know, very, very imperfect. Uh, it, if this is what we mean by perfection, um, of course, you know, what point in time are you going to choose? It's like the ultimate, uh, you know, point of the ultimate standard that uh, we don't have a standard either. Right now we're just using now. But um, it was interesting when Maureen Corgan said that the dread for the jury um, is that you're going to overlook something that becomes like huge, you know, and you're going to be the, the committee that failed to award the prize to Beloved, you know, to take an example of the Nobel, the, the, uh, the National Book Award. Um, they changed their whole structure when they missed that one. Um, but uh, she teaches a course, she said, on 2005 Booker Prize, right? And that's the year that John Banville's uh, novel, The Sea, won. I doubt anyone here has read The Sea. Um, it's a perfectly good novel. But it's also the year that Kazuo Ishiguro's Never Let Me Go was published. And Never Let Me Go, at least where I live, you know, teaching undergraduates, that thing is canonical now. I mean, that novel is very, very, very widely read and taught in the schools. So, you know, that committee. At this point, it looks like they missed, they missed something, yeah. Well, I'm gonna say for Beloved, you know, the one time that I was just looking for something to read when teaching a book, the quantity of criticism on Beloved was astonishing. It was like over a thousand hits when it was just, you know, really like less than 20 years since it had been published. So yes, astonishing. Um, all right, so we've got, let's see, a question. We're going to have an uh, audience response here for the poll again, but do prizes awarded to books shape your own choices about what to read? Go for it. You want to go for it, Pat? This would be your kind of, yeah? I, my hunch is that for, for readers of literary fiction or that type of reading currently, I think that prizes do make a big difference because I think there are so many books published that people look for ways of figuring out what are the ones they ought to choose from all the ones that have been published? So I think that people pay a lot of attention to the lists of nominees or just as we've discussed that the coverage that comes from winning a prize results in, in people choosing to read that. So I think that they, that they do continue to have uh, a real influence and at some point it might be interesting to note too that now places like Goodreads or other podcasts and personalities and influencers also have a huge impact, but maybe that's a question for another time. There are people, you know, Goodreads is a site where you, you, you maintain a collection, right, a social collection site of books, and you shelve your books according to shelves. And among the really active Goodreads users that, uh, that, that my team has been studying, one kind of shelf is like a Booker shortlist or Pulitzer um, nominated, you know, or National Book Award um, shortlist. So these people read those books and they check them off. And I do that, you know, I don't read all of them always, but I miss some, but, I, but, but that's just like one of the sets of, of books that in a given year I, I do try to read. And I think that people who read other kinds of fiction, um, like science fiction, um, we'll look and see what is um, shortlisted or what wins the Nebula or the Hugo, and they'll probably like pick those up and, and read them if they haven't already. And likewise for mystery readers, you know, I read mysteries. I look to see like what were the 
short what's the short list for the Edgar or whatever and, and, and choose a couple of those to read. So yeah, I think they work as a judgment device. I also think um, just knowing a Nebraska graduate who won an award for her book, her novel, um, it also opens you up to getting blurbs for your book for the next printing. Mm -hmm. And she got major authors to you know write a little thing for the back of her book and it made a huge difference. So there's a there's like multiple ways in which I think that plays out. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with with Pat and that it that it is it allows you to discern when there are so many books out there. And I, I think one of the an interesting fact about the Pulitzer is that in 1980 they publicized the runners up. Prior to that, it was pretty much a secret. And so you'll see now nominated for the Pulitzer Prize on an ad or on a book jacket that would not have been available back in 1970s. And so that broadens it a little more, brings those books more into the into the public. Well, I spent $75 nominating my book for the Pulitzer in biography, and it's not on my dust jacket. Of course, it went absolutely nowhere, but I knew my publisher wasn't going to do it, and I thought, well, why don't I just burn $75? You know? it's, it's all over your website, though, Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, my honoree position for a fourth tier award is on my website. So, um, but we got results here. We don't have a lot of people who frequently look at prize competitions. 11 out of 78, we got more answers on this one. Occasionally, 54 and never, 13. So that was our poll results. Um, uh, Melissa, I yes. mentioned though that even though someone doesn't necessarily seek out that list, the impact of a book getting a lot of coverage and conversation as a result of being on a list puts it in front of people even if they're not thinking, oh, I want a Pulitzer nominee to read. So there's that aspect also. Okay, so I just thought, we thought, well, how much evidence is there that Willa Cather consulted prizes or engaged with prize culture? And I think these probably actually don't quite get at the question because she may have read them before they got the Pulitzer, but of the group that we looked at that, you know, the well, books that won while she was alive that won the Pulitzer, um, so she wrote to Ferris Greenslit about Laughing Boy by Oliver Lafarge, that she liked it very much. And then she was annoyed when those sentiments appeared in an ad for the book and she had not authorized a blurb. So, um, she, but she still wrote, even though she was annoyed with um, Greenslit, she wrote to Wilbur Cross um, a few days later, have you read Laughing Boy? You'll like it. And she also asked Grant, uh, Greenslit to send a copy to Jan Hamburg in France explaining, I think you owe me this copy for having used my name in an advertisement. I wonder if it actually said Pulitzer Prize winning author Willa Cather likes this book. Um, so, uh, and then John Hersey, A Bell for Adano, which was a World War II novel published while World War II was still ongoing. She wrote to Fanny Butcher in 1945 asking if any good books have been written of late besides A Bell for Adano, which I think is splendid. Good form, good style, style not in the literary sense, but in a human sense, in very good manners. That, oh, manners. Maybe she was thinking of American manners and manhood. I don't know. That was a long parenthesis, but if you know of any new books that are both elegant and virile, I wish you'd name them to me. Wars are not conducive to any form of art, are they? Which is an interesting comment from someone who wrote a book which contained a long war sequence. Um, so now my final question, and then we'll open it up for audience question and participation. For those of you on the committee who have participated in prize culture in a broad sense, served on a prize jury, been involved in a selection process for a community reading program, this is one of the reasons Pat's here, submitted for prizes, been awarded for prizes, like what did you learn from the experience? I've been involved in our One Book, One Lincoln process for quite a while, and the way that program works, it's a community reading program where everyone reads the same book. For several years, we have a uh, routine where anyone can nominate a book that they've read. We have a committee of community members who choose three finalists, and then people vote on what the winning or featured title will be. And it is interesting to see people's responses to, the, to that group of three. We want the committee to choose a group of three that, as a group, uh, are books that have quite a bit of general appeal. Now, that can mean a lot of things, of course, 
Uh, some things are kind of practical, books that aren't too long. People have three months or two to read them. Um, we want to see some diversity, both in authors and in stories within that. And they need to be books, again, a logistical aspect that are available in a lot of different formats. But we do get quite a bit of pushback if too many of the books seem too problemy. Um, people want... <laughs> they don't want social commentary? Not so much, necessarily. And I think with... And, and, and what is interesting then to me is, is the impact of things such as does it have a happy or hopeful ending is often important, it seems like, to the general reading public. We want books that have a lot of discussion points within them. So sometimes we will have books that, um, I mean, we want all of our books to be quality books, but there might be some that are chosen partly because they have so many discussion points, maybe less quality. But within the thought of what makes a community read, those things come together in terms of what seems like a great selection. So as we look at that group of three, those are the variety of things that we're, that we're hoping for. And I would mention Becky Faber has worked a lot on the One Book, One Nebraska selection. And I think that there are similar conversations that go around that in terms of what is it that everyone wants to read. And I think the other aspect of this that is a discussion maybe for another day is some of the best discussion happens when people are very much at loggerheads about whether or not they liked the book. Um, it ends up to be a very good discussion about the book. Well, it's interesting when you say happy or hopeful ending. Undergraduates often are like, why are all the books we read in English classes so depressing? <laughs> right, right? They, they're expecting something different, perhaps. So. Well, and I think we get that for one book, one link, and why are so many of them yeah, depressing? Yeah, because they're like the kind of books that English professors would assign. It's kind of a vicious circle. What, what I learned when I, um, when I judged the, uh, the National Book Award is it's, um, it's a huge amount of work. It's just a huge amount of work. And un unlike uh, Dr. Uh, Corrigan, um, I didn't read 50 pages and then put the book down. Um, you know, I read, I read pretty much all of the 100 novels that had been allotted to me out of, the, out of the stack in the first round and only really had about 60 days to do that. And it was honestly all I did, you know, for, for, a, for a summer. And as summers are precious for an academic, because that's when you get your research and writing done, and that's basically what you're paid to do. And the National Book Award doesn't pay you much of anything. I can't remember, but it's a token sum for the hours that you put in. And this is very typical of prizes. You know, that, um, that somebody, I, I talked Thursday night about how you have like millionaires who set up prizes, you know. They set up prizes, there's often a big payout, $150,000 for the poet, you know, or the, the novelist who wins. But they don't set aside money for the judges. You know, they really don't, they don't think of it. They don't actually set aside, in most cases, set aside enough money for the whole administrative apparatus that's required to run the prize. Those things are often run on a shoestring and they're desperate, in the case of the National Book Awards, they need the nomination fees in order to, to, to run their operation. So that means more books nominated, that means more labor dumped on the, uh, on the judges who are basically uncompensated. Um, and this is finally a limiting factor if we're looking for one. Like prizes can only, there can only be so many prizes, at least in the book world, because there are only so many people capable of reading all these books and willing to do it for basically no, no money. So, yeah. so Jim, when you did it, I mean, I participated in the Great Plains Book Prize, which is the uh, you know, our, uh, Great Plains Center at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and we had subcommittees. So was it like you each, there were subcommittees and then they advanced around or did everybody read all the books? No, because we had 400 and something books and we just, there's no way that we could read them in the short time span between the end of June when you have the books and the list of books and the first of September when you have to have your long list. Right? It's just simply not possible. Right. So we divided it into four stacks and some of us had already read some books. And then we had a system where you were partnered with another reader where if you thought something was like on the cusp and needed another set of eyes, um, you call in your, your partner. You could also recuse yourself on books um, and move them along that way. So there was a certain circulation within, you know, uh, but by the end of the summer, we each out of our hundred or so uh, were proposing two for the long list, five judges, and that meant that we had 10 for the long list. And we, um, 
we, we, uh, we all read then those 10 and decided which five we wanted to put on the short list. So that's right. But it does seem that you, you wonder how being assigned to a subcommittee might determine whether or not you advance. That was the thing that I wondered on the Great Plains Book Prize was just, you know, and, and there were very different ideas because it's a big interdisciplinary center, but most of the books are really in the humanities. And you had, you know, a grassland biologist who had a different idea about how to judge an academic monograph in history, for example. It was interesting to, to sort of, you know. If we, if we had taken the four stacks and put them in the hands of different judges, we would have produced a different long list. There's no question, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I also wonder too, um, I think for the more commercially oriented prizes, you were very good and actually read all the way through, but I do wonder whether the PR and reviewing makes people pay more attention to some books or be more likely to read through to the end when they might dismiss books that aren't sort of pre-digested. So if you look at the book jacket on certain books, you know, like, this is a love letter to the Pulitzer Committee for Biography. This is a love letter to the Man Booker Prize Committee, right? You can spot that, and it can be very effective. Uh, that's, that's certainly true. Um, I wish there was more of that, you know, to guide us. Uh, because a, a lot of the books we read, we were reading in galleys, because they're scheduled for the fall publication market. And so you just see in galleys. And an awful lot of the novels that were nominated were um, first novelists, or novelists who, whose first novels had not been widely read and who I, I had no, you know, no views on and couldn't really look up. So uh, one, one would have wanted more prejudging, as they call it where some other group of judges, maybe graduate students or something like that, goes yeah. through and, and compiles information about the author and puts together a sort of a package and then decides you know, which 20 or something would go forward. There are book prizes that are done that way. Prairie but, Schooner Book Prize. But they need, more, they need more money and more administrative apparatus. In the NBA, they just say here they are. And the Pulitzer as well, apparently. Yeah. yeah. Um, any more comments from the panel before we go to audience questions? And we've got, we have a roving mic in the audience, I think. We've got a question. I really, it's hard for me to see because of the lights. I think someone's right next to you there. Yeah, uh, before we get to questions, we just want to say thank you everyone for coming. Um, and also, if you wouldn't mind filling out a session feedback report. Um, in the Willa Cather Foundation app, you can fill it out, or we will have paper feedback forms outside in the lobby. Sounds like most of you on the panel uh, admit, you know, that the, the processes for choosing awards and or determining excellence and greatness are flawed at best. And so my question involves first a comment and then a question about, you know, so the Oprah magazine went out of circulation in 2020 and um, her ability to bring such massive numbers of readership to a book uh, I don't think it's been replaced by anything uh, since then but but what do you what do you think the reason is for that you know my theory is simply that she she still has a book she club. still does have a book club what what's what's the reason for her popularity then you think it's because she's a person of the people from the people even though, of course, she has her specialists do the reading. Do, do you have any comments on why she has had, has so much power? She's Oprah. She's Oprah. She, she's Oprah. <laughs> no, I, 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 I think, and I would be curious to know how celebrity culture kind of ties into that, but I think that the role of influencers generally, and she's probably the influencer's influencer. Before the term was coined, really. Before the term was coined, yes, that, that that's who she was. And, and continues to be. So I don't, I think that there will always be people who, who want Oprah to say, here's what you should read. And I think when you look at her group of books, they have a lot of things in common probably uh, for, for the kinds of things that she looks for. But in terms of people reading and talking about what they read, I think, oh, as you know, Oprah had a remarkable influence and sort of paved the way for a certain kind of cultural conversation that I, I think has always happened, but she put a certain energy behind that that it, that it really needed, frankly. Yeah, and, and she's been doing it for 30 years, so it has that tradition. So anything that, as Kim, as you know, anything that she 
she supports um, goes right to the top of the bestseller list. And she, she supports what we would call literary fiction. Yeah. She does. Right. So Beloved is a really, and I've been talking about content. I'm just talking about structurally and in terms of technique. Beloved is a difficult read, and she got people to read it. Right, you know, and I that, think that was that, a very un, untypical, you know, it was a, that was a special kind of different Oprah pick, um, bringing Morrison on the show and everything, and and the feedback from you know the the, the readers, the Oprah Club, uh, you know, fan base, was this is too hard, you know, and Oprah herself said this is too hard. Um, so that was not a tip, that's not the sort of book that Oprah chose, but she chose very well. And there's never been anyone in the history of American letters who has been able to point to a book and make it a top bestseller every single time for 20 years. I mean, it's lightning in a bottle. And there's never been anything like it. The closest, I think, since then is Reese's Club. Um, and Reese Witherspoon, which is not nearly the same sort of level in terms of the numbers, and also of late has been more uh, hit and miss. You know, she knows not every time, but she definitely has like a large group of women readers. Her, her thing is, is stories that have women at the center, right? And they're kind of literary fiction, kind of what we used to call middle brow fiction, right? Um, uh, what's the one, what, what's the, uh, the huge, uh, Big Little Lies, right? that became a Netflix uh, a sp uh, film with Reese in it. So uh, that's pretty big, but it's not like Oprah. I think, too, it, it, there's a weird kind of full circle, too, in that way that the prize culture sort of has a long history in, in terms of court culture in that, you know, like a, a monarch or king would, like, select a specific artist to support, and then that would raise their, you know, ability to stand out. And so in some ways, you know, like Oprah is a queen, right? Like, is, yes, yes, so. She becomes a patron through the market. She guides the market and that becomes a form of patronage for particular artists, so. I think that makes sense to me. I think the other thing that Oprah was able to do was just really diversify the number of, the variety of authors and the variety of kinds of stories um, and then, of course, there's the whole Jonathan Franzen, the corrections blow up, where he didn't want Oprah's readers to read his great American novel. Well, and is that a certain turning point in any, in any award or any influencer that, that, that then at a certain point somebody says, I don't want that? Yeah, yeah. Not, not to defend Jonathan Franzen, but I'll just say, uh, you know, he, it wasn't that he, he was condescending, I think, to, um, to Oprah's readers. What he, what he was objecting to initially, and then he had to walk it back and apologize and all that, but, but what he was objecting to is that someone who is a commercial, um, as you say, you know, working on the business side as a kind of commercial patron can brand his book and have a new edition of the book, a new print run that says Oprah Club Book, and have it on the shelves as an Oprah Club book without his involvement um, or permission at all, right? So that so it was a sort of, yeah, read the contract is right. Of course they can, and they said, okay, all right, okay, but and sorry, I got everybody mad, but, but that, that was the objection, and I think it was kind of an interesting point uh, in relation to prizes as well as um, books. It's like, how come the author, you know, uh, doesn't get any say in the process, right? By the time the author wants to object, it's too late. Because you can't book club refuse, you can't book, refuse yeah. it. Book club editions were specified in your contract. That's why. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes. That, um, back around to selection process. As an individual juror, you said you were assigned a hundred books, and somebody else was assigned a hundred books. So split it up, so you could do it. Were, were your hundred books? in any way sort of all of one category and somebody else's hundred books were of another category or were each of the hundred a, a hodgepodge of books? Yeah, hodgepodge, we randomized it. We went down, just went down the alphabetical list and do each fifth book, you know, goes to you like that, just randomized it. And then you look at it and, and we made arrangements where like if I'd already read a book, then that would get moved over to me and I'd give one up. Um, and we also look to see like, are there some really, really, really long books? 
So books over 500 pages, we made sure that nobody had disproportionate share of those. We moved those around. Uh, and then there's recusal. So the, what was interesting to me was that, because the, the other four judges are, are novelists, right? And they, like, they have a lot of these novelists, they know them, they're friends and so on. That was okay. They weren't recusing themselves for that. But if they shared an agent, they shared an agent, they said, I can't, no, I can't do this. You know, Nicole is, is his agent too, and, and I can never do this. So that, that was something I hadn't expected. Now I, now I realize that's very common. Speaking as a person who absolutely adores reading, but is not in any sense of the imagination scholarly, um, I belong to a book club, and I've belonged to one for about 20 years. And at first, these are mostly people who are non-academics. In our book club, we have one English professor that taught where my husband did, and everybody else is just people who read a book once a month so they can be in a book club. So Oprah books often were good for that because they were generally consistent in quality. But now everyone's turned to Goodreads. And before they accept a book in book club, they want to read the review of Goodreads. And frankly, it annoys me. I, I don't want someone to tell me what book to read. Having said that, do I pay attention to maybe what's supposedly good, yes, because time is limited. But this is just a comment about people. And I know in Lincoln City Libraries, I'm from Lincoln, they have book club satchels. And so somebody will go in and just pick up a satchel and they'll take it to their book club and they can pass them out. Now we don't do that in the one I'm in, but I find it interesting because it's just like sight unseen. And we'll also read, um, Pulitzer books as well. We read um, the Colton Whitehead's book, The Underground Railroad, and books like that as well. So, but I guess my point is, is that Oprah and Reese Witherspoon are consistent. That, that, that book club Middle satchel street. thing, it's like buying the mystery, like some bookstores, yeah. like buy a mystery book, it's wrapped up, you don't know what's in it, yeah. Exactly, so. I'm interested that you that you look at Goodreads or that you, that your fellow club members uh, do because um, there are different ways to look at it, right? I mean, so you, you could look and just see the star rating and say this is a 4.3 rating, so it must be better than this other one. But but then you can look you know right under the hood and you start to see things that you look at the lower ratings and so so it's, there's no one way to well, I mean, take information from Goodreads. I do it too, though. <laughs> Other questions? Anybody? Yes. I do. Oh, hi, Erica. Hi. Um, I'm going to go back to the controversy cells conversation because I find it very intriguing. Um, we and we've talked about how Sinclair Lewis he declined the prize, but at the same time, he his um his newest book was being advertised, and it would say in big letters, Sinclair Lewis wins the Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> and his letter that declined the prize, he made 100 copies and sent them to contemporary authors, including Willa Cather. And so I have a kind of a two-part question for those who know Cather and then for those who know prizes. Now, this worked out really well for Sinclair Lewis and his popularity at the time. My, my one question that I've always wondered is, what did Willa Cather think of this show of declining a prize? And number two, um, is there any way this could have backfired if someone declines a prize in such a public way? Um, how can that backfire? But it's interesting, it sounds like his publishers were claiming the prize even as he was declining it. And they knew he was gonna decline it. Yeah, yeah. In that uh, Zoe Aiken's letter, she says it's bad taste, right, to, to just, I mean, grin and bear it and, you know, like, you just live through it and... Wait, wait, about which, sorry? The, the Zoe Aiken's letter about... 
about St. Clair Lewis? Is it about Aaron? Oh, no, she just says to Zoe Akins, just grin and bear it. It's in bad taste to. Oh, like, when Zoe Akins you know, gets the Pulitzer yeah. for drama. Okay. Um, I was doing a lot of reading before this and bumped into a lot of like academic articles about French um, literary culture where it is more common for authors in French culture um, to complain about getting an award. It's almost seen as like a cultural, like, like a sort of, you know, like I don't want this, you know, like I'm too good for it or it doesn't mean anything to me. Um, but that's where the, the grand or the, the pre femina comes in is that for women, it wasn't, you didn't have the luxury of being like, oh, I don't want this. Like you have to take it, right? Because of, you know, like stereotypes around women and, you know, like, like there's a there's sort of no way of winning, you know, potentially um, for some women. And so I feel like for Cather, you know, like there's definitely that in terms of backfiring, you know, for a, what, what, what does it mean for a woman in this culture to reject something that people might value, you know, and would they, you know, like that could be so damaging in so many ways, so. Yeah, when you think about the refusedicks, they, they will tend to be white males. They'll tend to be, um, you know, representative of a, a, a group that is winning the prizes. Um, <laughs> and they can kind of afford to condescend to them in a way. That, so Toni Morrison was very, very eager to win a major national book prize, having been passed over again and again. And when she was passed over by the NBA for, um, for, for Beloved, there was a letter was written by a bunch of, uh, of, of black intellectuals and writers um, with Toni Morrison's blessing and collaboration to the New York Times, basically demanding that the juries stop overlooking Toni Morrison and give her uh, a prize, which, which, which they did. And that would be considered in very bad taste, and she did take some, some heat for that. Um, you can't really imagine Philip Roth doing that. You know, he, he would more like say, I don't care. Right. But he'd always be on the short list, uh, right? I mean, right. as you were saying that the people who get to refuse prizes are the ones who are most likely to, are more likely to get the prize anyway, right? Yes. They're in the position of cultural prestige that they're going to get it. Exactly. Or, yeah. yeah. Hey, Melissa, this is, I guess, kind of a wrap-up comment, maybe if we're getting ready to move on, but um, I'm in a smaller group of uh, Cather lovers, for the last couple of years, we have a group called uh, Cather and Racial Equity, and so mm -hmm. we started doing, looking at her novels with uh, just a different perspective, trying to kind of uh, dive into issues around race or white supremacy, or, and we decided, uh, we finished up Death Comes for the Archbishop, and very rich discussion there, and we decided to do one of ours starting in January, even though we didn't know just how timely it would be with our current situation. Um, and yet, that book was so timely. I, I'm just going to the questions asked at the very end of the session. What, why do Cather's words matter and what can she tell us about our experiences today? When we started reading that, Russia had just invaded Ukraine. And we were reading this novel, The Pandemic. We were just coming out of COVID. And I think we were all struck that 100 years later, this novel spoke to us so deeply. Uh, white supremacy, you know, white nationalism. Um, it, it was just, that's, uh, it, it was just remarkable. And I'm, I'm still moved by it. And I think that's what keeps us coming back is that she has something to say as the years go by that we just seem to look at in a different way. So anyway, it, it was a great experience. So. Thank you. Anybody else? Willa has struck a deep chord in all of us. Oprah, I think, has struck a deep chord in humanity. The enduring literature has struck a deep chord. What do you guys think is that enduring deep chord that keeps, I mean, it, it, it's hooking us. What do those three things have in common to you guys? So you mean what keeps us reading? What's that, uh, that common thread? I mean, they've all, they, they resonate deep in all of us. I mean, it's, I think more than even the prizes, the enduring literature endures because it, it hits that thing. What is that thing to you guys? 
I, I'm, a, I'm a contrarian on this. I don't think that there is a universal strain that draws all of us to books and that makes some books better than other books. I think that people have very different needs as readers and there are very different things that serve different readers. And I'm perfectly fine with that, right? Whether you want to cry, whether you want to laugh, whether you want to get social criticism, whether you want to forget the world, I mean, people have different, different reasons for reading, and I don't, I don't feel like people have to share mine or even, I don't know. Uh, anybody else want to try to tackle it? I thought that uh, Maureen Corgan put it well last night when she described the conversation among the judges at the Pulitzer where they said, they each like laid their cards on the table, this is what matters to me, the book, you know, and for Michael Cunningham, language, the beauty of the language, the poetics, of the work, um, for for someone else it might be story. I think uh, maybe Corgan herself, you know, plot. I think narrative is a very very powerful thing. And for some people, I count myself in this category. I need narrative every day. You know, I'm reading a, a novel or I've got an audible um, novel going in my ears. You know, all the time. Or or I watch a movie. Like I want story. I'm just a junkie for narrative. I think for other people, it could be character, you know, that there's a, ta a certain kind of attachment to fictional characters is very powerful. So I, I'm just agreeing with you, Melissa, that there's not, I don't think there's one, one thing, but these are powerful things, powerful forms of attachment. And kind of following on that, Professor English, I'm superstar librarian Nancy Pearl points to what she calls four gateways, which are, she describes as plot, language, setting, and character and that typically a reader focuses on one or two of those to the exclusion of the others often. And a trick for a librarian in getting the question, what should I read next, is to listen for what the reader is seeking and what they have found compelling in, in the previous books that they've enjoyed. So thinking of, of books from that angle in terms of, of of people's reading. I tend to add one more category, which I call empathetic immersion, that I think a lot of us seek an opportunity to be in someone else's life for a while in any of those ways. Um, so as, as you ask that question, I'm, I'll be thinking about that for a while, of what is it about books that has us going back to them all the time. So kind of apart from the scholarly study, what is, what is that thing? And how can it vary so much? And, and yeah, I would say though, at the moment of like high postmodern, I took a postmodern American novel class in the 1980s with a professor I shall not name right now, but because Jim would know who the professor is, but um, I found it so profoundly alienating. I will say that the really like you know John Barth that kind of stuff, Hawks, um, Pynchon, I found them so so alienating and. Um, have been liberating them from my bookshelves recently as I'm trying to wean towards retirement. And I'm like, why are those books still on my shelf that traumatized me anyway? Yeah. I, th I think I know who, who that professor was. <laughs> yeah. but, but you know, but I, but I think for, for people who, who love that kind of work, um, it may be that the empathetic um, attachment is with the author and that what they're really involving themselves with is the sort of compositional, um, uh, you know, uh, game that the author is playing with the, with the reader. And we were, we were told that that kind of, and this is why I came in, that that kind of empathetic attachment, that these authors were breaking that, and that was the whole point, that you shouldn't read breaking that way. Breaking with the that, characters, but maybe not with themselves, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Did you want the microphone? Mike, you were, you were just. I was just going to add, a, um, when I first started teaching, my favorite evaluation of all time was this, um, dude in my class who just stared at the carpet all semester <laughs> and um, didn't seem like he was paying attention and he wrote this amazing like note about how we had read um, uh, we had read uh, some slave narratives in class and he just wrote really beautifully about how he never understood what it was like to be that person and literature like took him into that world and he didn't go into the semester ever thinking that that would happen to him, but that he had this encounter with a, a way of life that was so foreign, but yet so close to him at the same time. I didn't even know he was paying attention. 
And, you know, and it, it's just really powerful how, like, that can happen, that we can really get be surprised. And, yeah. When I, um, when, when my jury had this conversation of, like, well, so what, what, what constitutes a potentially winning novel to you? And we each had our different ways of describing that. And what I, what I said was that um, I want a novel that, that gets under my skin. Like I finish reading it, and it's like, okay, now I'll move on to the next one, next one. But I just, like, that one is still, it's like, this happens to me, it's not, it doesn't happen that often. But every now and then I read, I read a novel, and it just, it's like, I keep thinking about it. It just bothers me, and it just won't go away. And sometimes I don't think a novel is all that great when I finish it. But then six months later, I'm still thinking about that novel. I didn't think it was all that good. That tells me something. So that's what I was looking for. And Colson Whitehead's Underground Railroad is that way for me. It's a novel that still bothers me, that novel. I find it very, a kind of an annoying, a difficult, and obnoxious book in some ways. Not, not like an easy, pleasant read, and also not, not, not a kind of ordinary slave novel. It's not beloved. It's a very different kind of, kind of book. And it's, um, anyway, I won't go into it. But, but, but so that's one of the reasons that I've, I supported that, that novel. Yeah, I, I agree with Jim. Um, one of the, of the novels, when I look back on all of the Pulitzer winners that I really enjoy or remember, you know, the ones that do get under, under my skin, the ones, I'm looking down this list and there's 20 or 30 that I'm having a hard time remembering the plot. <laughs> but when I remember uh, Richard Powers' The Overstory, um, I'm just, that one continues to stick with me a couple years later, something that, you know, as I w we were driving through Colorado and we saw all of the Aspens and I started thinking about that book again. And, you know, that's, that's where it, it hits me too. All right, that might be a good place for us to end, I think. Yep, thank you. Yes, thank you for coming, everyone. Um.